Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is, of course, our next lecture in our class. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will get going. And here we go. Okay. Welcome back to our class on the philosophy of the television hit of the 90s. Cheers. Today we're going to be talking about the character Norm. That's a pretty old joke. Um, truth be told, that joke's even a little too old for me. But when I hear the word Norm, I think of this guy walking into the room and everybody shouting, Norm, even though I've only ever seen about two episodes of the show. But we are talking about science and its norms. Our major reading for this lecture is the piece from Robert K. Merton. At the top here, we should differentiate Robert Merton is a different person than Thomas Merton, who we had read previously. Robert Merton outlived Thomas Merton by several decades. Thomas Merton is a monk. You know, he's a philosopher, theologian, social critic, poet. Robert Merton is a sociologist and a scientist. Same last name, no relation. It's a common last name if you're English. First, what is a norm? So norms are typical standard and what's usually expected in any given culture. And they are the written and unwritten rules of conduct in a society, culture, or even a smaller group. Yeah, I've lived in a couple of different communities. Those communities have different norms. You know, if you live in the city of Chicago, what's normal in the winter, what's the norm, is that in certain neighborhoods, you save your parking spot by putting something in the parking spot because you have to shovel it for yourself. But then, you know, one norm that I kept thinking of when I was recording this was in sports. What do you do when you win or when you lose? You shake hands with the other team. Got a picture of Michael Jordan here because I was watching The Last Dance pretty recently. And what's he upset about when he finally wins his first title? Well, it's that Isaiah Thomas wouldn't shake his hand, right? And that's where these memes of, and I took that personally. And that hate carries to this day. That's where those memes come from because the other team, they broke the norms. And the interesting thing, of course, is that the rules changed around Michael Jordan. He shaped the norms. Moving on, what are some other norms? So leave no trace in camping is another big one. I came out of the camping world. That's everything but a divine command that when you leave, you make sure it looks like you were never there. Tipping at restaurants is a cultural norm. It doesn't happen everywhere in the world. Other places, waiters are paid well enough that they don't need a tip. In baseball, we have the seventh inning stretch. Uh, on the right here, we have a picture of Harry Carey, legend of Cubs broadcasting. Did not live long enough to see the Cubs win, but there's a beautiful little, little clip of him saying, someday we will go all the way. And they usually play a video of him singing the seventh inning stretch at Cubs games these days. Another norm we have, of course, is something like using turn signals, where that one is a written rule. And you notice when people don't do it because it affects your own driving. Thinking of our friend Robert Merton, though, he talks about these norms as the ethos of science. And an ethos is a characteristic spirit. It is, you know, when you think of science, this is what should be conjured in your mind as sort of the the soul of the thing. He says norms are prescriptions, proscriptions, preferences, and permissions. In other words, they are things you should do, should not do, things you'd prefer to do, and things that you are allowed to do. Those are scientific norms. They're also legitimized institutional values and institutional imperatives. You know, we have some institutional values here at UNT. You know, what's the thing that they want students to have? I think the university uses the word grit. Yeah, that's the norm that they are shooting for. These things should be in an ideal world, and that's what Merton is posting here as ideals. He knows that these have not been lived up to, but he's, you know, these things should be internalized by scientists so that they are the thing you do when you're not thinking about it. Because, of course, if it's a norm, it's just what regularly happens. And what's his goal of the science of the sciences? Well, it's the extension of certified knowledge through empirically confirmed regularities. If you'd watched the previous lecture, 
you'd recognize that immediately as you know the extension of knowledge that is the project of science set forth by bacon and descartes you know more knowledge for the sake of knowledge and then maybe later it gets applied in other ways but to the scientist himself merton is saying don't think about how these things are applied think about extending knowledge okay so let's talk about his four norms first one universalism what the scientist discovers is the truth no matter how no matter where no matter who and what is truth should be practical claims what are examples here you know gravity weight and measure outside of the sciences there's a speaker thinker all around interesting guy he's not a scientist he's called henry rollins yeah kind of a big muscular fella does a lot of talking about this or that social issue but he talks about weightlifting and says, you know, what centers him is the knowledge that every time he goes to the gym, 200 pounds is 200 pounds. Friends come and go, but gravity is forever. And yeah, that's, that's the norm of universalism right there. It doesn't matter who makes the claim. It's an impersonal fact. You know, it's, it's mathematics. Two plus two is four, no matter who. And, you know, asking questions, seeing if these always apply. The first question we might want to ask is, can we really be impartial? Can we be impartial enough to say that no matter who discovered something, it really ma yeah, what matters is the truth? Eh, maybe I think the positioning of the person doing the science might matter. And then this has also been inadequately practiced and science is often pushed to take a side. And Merton acknowledged this, is, this in the piece that we read. He writes about how scientists have been pushed to be men of war to develop new planes, tanks, and bombs because governments have demanded it. They have not been universal. They have been specific and they have worked for specific governments or specific institutions. Then his other norm is communism and other places, I think even somewhere in our textbook, it's softened to communalism because of course the word communism is a loaded word. And Robert Merton does not mean communism in the sense of like Karl Marx. He means it in the sense of that these theories of laws and these theories and the laws of nature, they have no owner, right? They should belong to everyone. They're in the public domain. What a scientist should win is not ownership of their theory, but you know, esteem and accolades, recognition. An example we might look to here and say, yeah, that's the ideal. That's who you want to look up to is Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine. He famously did not patent his polio vaccine. Why didn't he patent it? Because it belonged to everyone and it could save lives. And why would he want to profit and let some people die in the name of his own profits? The other value here in the terms of the communism of science is that scientific discovery should not be a part of capitalist enterprise. Again, pointing at Jonas Salk saying, do that. What are some problems here? Well, we know from history that science has been deeply entwined with, cap with capitalist enterprise and many life-saving, and I have a typo that should say life, not live, I apologize. These discoveries have been commercialized in the past. That's a problem. And then these awards and accolades are not really distributed fairly. If you look at the average science paper, it has a lot of names on it. The majority of them are, in many cases, graduate students who are not paid the same as the scientist who gets top billing, who would have done less of the work but supervised the graduate students who did the actual work that led up to that paper. But that person at the top is going to be the one getting the awards and accolades. Is that okay? It's a question that I don't have an answer for you, uh, for with you, because I am not myself a scientist and would not write papers that way. Then the next norm, disinterestedness. So for Merton, no altruism or ego should take precedent in scientific inquiry. You know, it's not about trying to save lives. It's not about trying to improve humanity or improve your own standing in the world. It is just about the extension of knowledge. And he says that fraud is rare. And is it though? Well, we'll ask that question again another time. We actually have a whole section on fraud. Um, so we'll get there. We'll put a pin in it. We'll come back to it. What else? So we have being detached as a necessity for institutional stability. Culture changes, cultural values come and go. 
there's always going to be a pushback from someone. And the idea here is scientific institutions need to be a step or two removed from society so that they can do their work well. Yeah, you know, like there's always going to be controversies. There's going to be things like the Galileo incident or more recently in history, controversies over evolution. And that the scientist needs to not care about that. He needs to only worry about doing what might be classified as good science, following inquiries, doing experimentation, not worrying about where the findings go. Problems? I don't know how district I don't know how disinterested somebody can actually be. I think we might all actually have a, a little bit more of a stake in the game than we think. And do some issues demand we take a side? You know, like how neutral was Jonas Salk actually being? I, I think you could look and say by choosing not to patent the polio vaccine, he was actually choosing a side. It's just that the side he was choosing was to not make money. Then we have the final one, which is organized skepticism. That the scientist should only believe what can be proved. And it's not about belief. It's about sticking to the facts. What matters here is verification. And thinking back, that's the Karl Popper idea, right? That science needs to measure things that through experimentation could be proved wrong by the methods of the experiment. We believe in gravity because we have done plenty of experiments to see that gravity is a real law of nature. And this does cause conflict with other institutions because it can seem like religious doctrines or different political beliefs are being rejected outright by scientific institutions. You know, there's no sacred or profane, there's only the facts. And what can be tested should be tested. And if your religious beliefs happen to just be in the way of that testing, well, Sorry, but science is going to get in the way. And so what are some problems here? Well, what counts as verification? Uh, this class is focused on ethics and science, which means we're sticking to mainly the frameworks of science, which involves reason and rationality. But are those the only sources of truth? Well, that's going to depend on who you ask and where you look. You know, obviously, in science, yes, that is the only form of truth. But... In other places, maybe not. You know, if in the realm of religion, you know, if you were to ask, you know, is reason the only form of truth? No, people would say you can learn from tradition or experience. And science has a more narrow view. Whether or not that's right or wrong, that's another question. And then who decides what is and isn't testable? And this is where a lot of violence can be done to minority communities who have, like, say, their cultural history tested by scientists from the outside, where you know, DNA tests might say, actually, you're, you know, your particular group of people didn't come from this place that is your ancestral home. You came from over there across the world. And why are they allowed to say who, whose origin story is correct? You know, that seems like a step too far. So we might want to question who gets to decide what is and isn't testable. More interesting here, I am curious about Merton's norms as virtues, because as I read through these, this sounded a lot like virtue theory to me, but I'm not quite certain if it is. So let's think about it for a minute together. So accepting these as virtues, the virtues would be universalism, communism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. Again, communism meaning something different than political communism. But if those are the virtues and maybe the golden means, what then are the excesses and deficiencies of each of these? Because Robert Merton doesn't lay those out for us. And so we're kind of left to think of what would they would be because he doesn't really mention virtue in his piece that we read. But if we did accept these as scientific virtues, that might help us account for the ways that science has not always totally lived up to these ideals that he's setting out. And again, he is setting out ideals. These are things that Robert Byrne wants science to live up to, but is not presently living up to. He is aware of all of the violence that has done, been done in the history of science. And so 
if these are virtues, another question comes up, which is, are these the virtues that science needs? Should they change? You know, are there others we need and how do we live up to them? We might think that these four are great, but we might want to expand the list, right? Like, is there a place for justice in science? Is there a place for equality? Or even, I don't know, a need for scientific inquiry to be useful? And those are not answered in this list. So if you were going to develop your own theory of scientific virtues, what else might needed, need to be added here? I don't know. I don't have answers to that question. Then there are some other thinkers that build on Merton's sense of norms. There's a thinker named Thomas Kuhn, who was himself a scientist, and he likes the Mertonian norms, but he wants to build on it a little bit. He says that really science operates in what he calls paradigms, which means that the norms are changing and they change every once in a while through different social influences, and then they give direction to what science should do. And he lists his own criteria for good science, which are accuracy, scope, fruitfulness, consistency, and simplicity. You know, fruitfulness, that might be another good virtue to have in terms of science, that what is discovered needs to be useful because otherwise, why are, why are we researching it? I read a headline that there were some scientists who figured out that they could wipe the memories of a snail. Great, why are we spending money on this? Or there was a, a psychological experiment done to see if sandwiches cut into triangles taste better. And it turned out that, you know, people thought that the triangle sandwiches tasted better. Great. What do we do with this, this information? How fruitful is it? And then another thinker that I'm going to read more about because I thought it was interesting. We have Helen Longino, who says there are the constitutive values, you know, the, the values from inside the thing. And that would be the Mertonian norms for science. But then also there's contextual values that the social and cultural influence around the scientist and the experiment, they have an effect. I, I want to read more about that because I am somebody who thinks that the position that you are thinking from, that you are reading something from, changes what you get out of it. So I'm going to do a little bit more reading there and maybe pop back in with this for next week. So sorry, there's not a lot of information on her. I'm curious. I will bring my curiosity to the next lecture after I do some research. Another question that we might want to ask. We've been talking about the norms of science, but how might science actually shape cultural norms? And I think it does. And so I'd like to talk about this more another time, maybe in a discussion question, not this week, but another week, which is, can science shape our cultural norms? And there's a few ways I think it might. First one is your social media bubble. Those things shape your idea of what is and is not normal in society. You know, you only get usually opinions of people that agree with you based on whoever your friends on Facebook are or whatever ads you've clicked or your search terms. You know, the reality around you on the internet is constructed by an algorithm and you feed into that thing, but you are not its creator. And so someone else is responsible for the code that shapes your sense of cultural norms. And I find that to be fascinating and terrifying because does it help us? Does it do any good? I'm not sure. And then another one, one that uh, depending on how old you are, you might actually remember a time before it, that being constantly available for communication is a norm now, but it wasn't always, you know, we've got our, or magic rocks, right? And on those things, you've got so many different ways of somebody reaching you. You've got Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, text, email, WhatsApp, whatever. And there's, you know, if somebody needs to get a hold of you, they can. But in ye olden times, you might have to write a letter and you wouldn't get a response for quite a while. That has completely changed our opinions on communication, on how much we can trust people when they're not getting back to us immediately. Then we have a few other examples here, right? The availability of vehicles changes our idea of far. You know, what's far away when you can drive is different than what's far away when you're walking. Then what about grocery stores? This is a classic of environmental philosophy. Ask people, where does food come from? Most of us today would say the grocery store, 
and not the animal or the plant or the farm. That is a difference in our thinking of the source of food that is completely cultural, completely based on the influence of technology in particular cultures. One that might be more obvious, a way that technology has shaped our norms is digital learning tools. We have easy access to information, you know, like I'm dropping a complete ebook into our Canvas class this week that is optional for you to read. And, you know, you used to be you had to go to a library to get a book. And with an ebook, you can search it for the information you need, which is really helpful if you have to write a lot of papers. Then there's distance learning. I'm delivering to you, I'm delivering this class to you from an undisclosed location somewhere. It's not a traditional classroom setting. It's changed the way that I would want to teach. I'm much more conversational in my teaching style, and now I have to deliver these internet lectures. That is a change in our social norms in terms of education. And then the way that you take a test can be monitored through the internet with respondus, where your instructor, if they so choose to exercise so much authority, gets a window into your home for a little bit while you take a test on your computer. That is a big change in norms. And then also the permanence of information. Those angsty Facebook posts you made in seventh grade are on the internet forever. They don't actually go away. Someone will always have access to them and your future employers might look at them. And for some of us, we just have to deal with that forever. So those are just a couple of thoughts I had there. I think we will continue the conversation on how science and technology might shape culture another time. I don't know where, but I'd like to block out some more space for it. So what's next? Um, next week, please watch episodes one and two of Cosmos. I have those posted on Canvas. So no reading for next week, just watching. I'll come up with some directions on how to cite those well. Um, in general, I want to be pretty loose with how we do citations in our discussion posts anyway, but I'll give you a little direction on that. And then also watch lectures eight and nine, depending on my own little research stuff for next week, I might condense those into one, just because we're not reading much, we're watching two things. So we'll see. I'll keep you posted. If I do shrink it down into one lecture, I will update the syllabus and update the schedule so that there's no confusion there. And you also have a quiz. Quiz two, which is over module two, which we have been out of for a week now by the time you're done with this. That's due on February 12th. I'm trying to keep those easy. Uh, I did realize that I had an error in quiz one. And so I'm just going to give everybody the point for that question. No harm, no foul. Sorry about that one. You get a point. Uh, other than that, let's talk about a discussion post for this week. This is of course due by 11.59 on Friday. If you can, it is best to write these earlier so that people can actually interact with you and so that you can interact with your peers a little easier. So the question for this week is, I want you to take a look at Merton's norms. Are these virtues or are they something else? If they are virtues, are these the virtues that science needs today? Or do we need different scientific virtues? If we need different ones, what should they be? Then if Merton's norms are not virtues, well, what are they? Please give me some answer there. And then are the norms sufficient for scientific inquiry or you know, should we replace them with something else? So in other words, are, Norton, are Merton's norms virtues and are they what is needed? If not, what should replace them? That's it. Other than that, that is kind of all we have today. And I want to thank you for joining me once again. I will see you all next week. I look forward to reading your discussion posts. Everybody's doing a really great job with those. I'm super proud of you all for that. And yeah, let's continue the conversation on our discussion boards. Thank you and have a great day.